gave his life for us. Come on, can we give him a big shout of praise? And Jesus is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, come on, go with me to Luke chapter 15, and I'll let you have a seat. Luke chapter 15, I got 10 verses for you today. We're finishing up our series called God Math. We love to stand in honor of God's word. If you're still able, I know you've been standing for like 67 minutes. Come on, I'm going I'm to have you seated in just a second. But I'll just tell you, Luke chapter 15, we're in this series called God Math, and I cannot wait to walk through what we're going to walk through today. Um, but I love this passage of scripture in the Bible. And as you're getting there, Luke chapter 15, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So Luke is a gospel, an eyewitness account of Jesus. I'm going to invite you to Easter at Purpose this weekend, this coming weekend. And I'm just going to tell you, you're looking around at 945 on the Sunday before Easter, right? How many of us know that a lot of time people come to church on Christmas and Easter only? Come on, somebody, right? CEO Christians, what we kind of call them. And, and I want you to understand something really quick. We've decided to have five services, okay, five services, two on Friday night and three on Sunday morning. But I am going to ask you, and this is, can I, can I be your pastor for just a second ask a tough question? Can I do that? About six of us and say, can I do that? Okay, here's what I'm going to ask you. I know this time is very comfortable for a lot of you. And if it's your only time that you can come, I absolutely understand it. I want you to be here at 945 next Sunday. But would you be willing to give up your seat so that we can reach one more person with the gospel next weekend? And I, I, I'm not asking you to do that for forever, but next weekend especially. Would you make plans to come to Friday night? All five services are exactly the same. And so Friday night, 530 and 7. And then Sunday morning at 815, 945, and 1115. Our 945 and 1115 services are going to be slammed, all right? And so I'm asking you, would you be willing to give up your seat at the 945? Maybe come at 815. Yes, the Lord is awake at 815. Come on, somebody, all right? You may be like, I'm not, but the Lord is, is, is doing some incredible stuff through our first service. I'm going to invite you to that. Or just come on Friday night. And I'm going to invite you to be a part of this weekend. It's going to be a great, we're expecting anywhere between 1,500 to 2,000 people to be on campus this weekend. It's going to be great. It won't be the same without you, but I'm asking you, can I ask a hard question? Would you be willing to give up this comfortable 945 seat for somebody that's going to come for the first time next week? Everybody okay? Okay. I just want to, you at Luke 15 right now? Are you there? Are you there? Good. Luke chapter 15, if you're ready for God's word, say I'm ready. Awesome. Luke 15 verse 1, this is what the Bible says. It says this. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus. Come on, tap your neighbor and say, I'm sure glad you're here. Go ahead, just let them know. Okay, okay, just, just go with me. Watch what it says. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them, right? And so Jesus told them this story. If a man had a hundred sheep and one of them goes to, gets lost... What will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he found it, he will joyfully, somebody shout joyfully. Joyfully. joyfully carry it home on his shoulders until he arrives. And he will call his friends and family and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me. Somebody say, let's party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. And in the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God over 99 others who are righteous and have not strayed away. And he goes on to tell another story. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and her neighbor and neighbors and say, rejoice with me. Somebody say, let's party. That's what she says, rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. And in the same way, Jesus says, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. And so I, I read that today. We're finishing up God math, which has been this series on the idea of numbers in the Bible that just don't make sense, right? And so we're finishing up. I just want to honor Pastor Damien where he's running around right here. He's back there in the back. But last week, that message on forgiveness was unbelievable. And if you happen to miss it, please go back, watch it, and literally get blessed by watching it uh, because he crushed it last week. And so we're going to finish the God Mass series today. And it's this idea, and this isn't going to make sense because there's some numbers in the Bible that don't make sense. But here's the idea of the title is 99 is less than 1. 
All right, so 99 is less than one. We'll talk about it. I'm going to pray a really long prayer, then you can finally have a seat, okay? Lord, speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, tap your neighbor. Say, you look good and you sound good at church today. Look good and sound good at church. Awesome, 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 awesome. Well, I am, uh, I'm so glad that you're here. So thankful for you. Uh, Luke chapter 15, I'll just be honest, one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. How many of us in the room have ever lost something? Anybody in the room? Come on, if that's, if that's you, wave your hand in the air like you just do care. Come on. How many of you lose your keys all the time? Come on, somebody. You know what? I've lost so many things. My family has decided to put a geotag, like Apple tag thing on my wallet so that we can track where my wallet is all the time because your boy loses stuff all the time, all right? I don't know if you're anything like me, but... Uh, I lose stuff all the time. And I think about this chapter right here, and I love this. This is probably my favorite chapter in all of the Bible right here, Luke chapter 15. I want to give you a little bit of context because I love looking at the life of Jesus. And Jesus, as he is teaching, you got to understand that as Jesus is speaking, people are turning up everywhere, right? And I'm not just talking about just any kind of people. I'm talking about all kind of people are showing up to hear Jesus speak. And I just love this aspect so much. We see right there. In those first couple lines that we read, Luke 15, that guess what? It said this. It said that tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. And this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them, right? I, and I'm so fascinated that if you look at the life of Jesus I'm so fascinated with who were attracted to the life, the love, the ministry of Jesus. I'm talking about all kinds of people. Listen to me. Jesus did not attract just the polished, the put together, the perfect people. No, he attracted busted, broken people, people whose lives were in shambles, people with some issues, people that had some problems, people that had some past. He, he attracted a lot of ratchet people. Come on, somebody, all right? That's what Jesus, every time Jesus opened his mouth, everywhere he went, everywhere he showed up, people would show up. And listen, people that wouldn't normally go to the synagogue showed up to hear Jesus. And something about this guy named Jesus that magnetized the lost, the broken, the busted people to him. And I just got to thinking, you know what, I want to be a church that's just like the life ministry, message, and love of Jesus. Because if we are preaching the same gospel that Jesus preached, we ought to be reaching the same kind of people that Jesus reached. And I want to be a church that says it like this. We may not have it all together, but we got our eyes on the one who has holds it all together. Right? We may not be perfect, but we are fixated on the perfect one. And as long as I can get to him, he can fix anything. That's what I want the cry of our church to be. And so Jesus, I just love looking at his life. Man, ratchet people would show up. So if I could just do a, a little, can I, can, I, can I play a game today? Can we do that? I'm going to split the room in half again like I did a few weeks ago. Let's see. This side's the ratchet side. Come on, somebody, all right? So, all right, everybody, everybody, when I point this way, you got to say ratchet, all right? You got to say it. You literally have to say ratchet in church. This is happening. Yes, it is. Okay. Here we go. Ready? Oh, here we go. Ratchet side. Okay, so, so one side of the room, as we, as we begin to read the Bible, what you'll understand is that one side of the room is filled with tax collectors, other notorious sinners, people that, that are busted and broken, that are ratchet, all right? And on the other side of the room, we got the religious people. And come on, you got to sit up a little bit straighter. Got to shimmy your shoulders a little bit on this side over here, okay? Like, like we got the religious people on one side, we got the ratchet people on the other side, all right? We got religious, we got ratchet, and they're all gathered around this guy named Jesus. Jesus attracted people rather than, I think maybe the Pharisees might have got upset, like the religious side might have got upset because all the ratchet people was going to the, like instead of coming to church, they was going to hear Jesus, right? And so instead of coming to their services, they were going to hear Jesus, and I got to thinking about it. Uh, but, I, but I think a lot of times when I think of a Pharisee, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is this idea that, guess what, I think of Jafar from Aladdin. Anybody in the room? Like when you ever, Jafar, you know what I'm talking about, like long skinny beard, long, th yeah, like that's who I think of in all the bells and whistles and the big hat. That's what I think of when I think of Pharisee. And I got to thinking about it. You know what God does? God loves the ratchet, but let's, let me share something with you. God also loves the religious 
He loved them both. He, he, he attracted both the ratchet and the religious, and he loved them both. The only problem with the religious was that they did not know what Jesus was coming to offer them. The fact is it's hard to give somebody medicine if they don't believe that they're sick. Right? It's hard to get somebody to grab a hold of a life jacket who doesn't realize that they're drowning. And that's what I love about salvation with God is that you don't come to Jesus all boastful, all put together, everything figured out, your pride. No, no, no. We come to Jesus recognizing that I am a sinner. I am broken. I am in need of a Savior. I cannot fix myself. I cannot get well on my own. I can't go to church enough. Come on, is there anybody in here that can testify that God works with broken people who realize that they need Him? Come on, give Him a big shout of praise if you believe that today. But what, 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 what the Pharisees and the religious people couldn't figure out is why they were even around Jesus. Like, why are those people even welcome to you, Jesus? Like, why, why are you here? Like, why are you bringing them into your circle? Jesus, why are you hanging out with the notorious B.I.G. ratchet people, okay? Like, why, why are you doing that? And what happens is I love Jesus so much because Jesus could have answered them straight off. Jesus could have, like, I mean, they could have had a debate. They could have done anything like that. He could talk to them. I guess he could take them down real quick. He could argue with them, but that's not what Jesus does. In fact, in verse 3, we see that Jesus decides, you know what he does? He tells a story. That Jesus tells a story. Not just any story, but three stories, actually. We'll talk about them in just a second. But I got to thinking, as Jesus is saying, oh, okay, hey, you want to know why I'm coming? You want to know why I'm hanging around all these people? You want to know why I, uh, I'm inviting them to eat and why I'm eating dinner with them? Well, guess what? I got a story to tell you. Pull your chair up. Let's talk for a little bit, right? And this is what Jesus does. He tells a story. How many of us know there's power in a story? Right? When you, somebody shares their story, there's just something about a story. that Man, I'm just thinking, whoo. Man, some of you in the room, you think that you have to go to Bible college or that you have to memorize the book of Revelation before you tell your God story. And I don't believe that that's true today. I came to remind somebody today that stories matter and your story matters. The fact is that I'm telling you that you have to tell your story of how God saved you. Tell the story of how God redeemed you. Tell your story on how you used to be addicted, but now he's delivered you. Tell your story on how you used to be bitter towards someone or something that happened to you. But after listening to a message from Pastor Damien like last week about forgiveness and bitterness, that you can realize I've been forgiven so I can forgive. Anybody got a living story of the goodness of God that you've been redeemed? Come on, give him a big shout of praise in this place if that's you. You got a story to tell. You got a story to tell. I, I just want to just tell you, we don't need people acting like they got it all together. We need some people who will stand up and say, yeah, that's who I was. But because of Jesus, that's not who I am any longer. I'm different. I'm changed. I'm healed. And I'm whole. There's some power in a story. And what does Jesus do? He tells a story. He tells them a story. Not just one story, but actually three stories all with the same theme and he tells the story of the lost sheep. See if you can find the theme. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, here we go. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Okay, th these are the stories that Jesus tells. He decided to tell a story of the lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. Anybody see the similarities there? Anybody see the commonality there? It's this idea of the lost. And I want you to see something. I want, I, I want to just tell you today. That I think the thing that we need to understand that Jesus is trying to communicate to these people. He's trying to let them know, hey, doesn't matter if you're religious or you're ratchet, guess what? We're all lost at one time. That we're all lost at one time. That, that you need to understand that our default setting of being born into this world is that we're all lost. That every single person is lost. That we've all been born into this world with sin. And I, I want to just tell you that as, again, you look to your right or to your left down your roll. Or as you, as you go and you're at Walmart or you're at Kroger's, come on with an S. Yes, I said with an S. Come on. Or you're at your job or you're in your family. There's two types of people. And I want to just be, make it very simple. There's lost people and there's found people. That's it. There's lost people and there's found people. And Jesus takes these three different stories with one general theme, 
And he declares to us, and he begins to tell you and I, and this is the thing I want you to walk away with right now. The next thing I want you to write down is he's trying to get to you and I and let us know that Jesus is obsessed with lost things. That Jesus is obsessed with lost things. In fact, if you go and look at Jesus' mission statement, why did he come? What, what was his role coming? Why did he come to earth? Luke chapter 19, if you go over a few chapters from where we are today, You'll find in verse 10 that Jesus tells us that the Son of Man, that's himself, came to seek and to save those who are what? Come on, say it with your chest. Those who are what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seek and to save those who are lost. I like that he says he didn't just come to save the lost, but to seek and to save the lost. Meaning that Jesus is actively looking for those who are lost. Anybody got a lost story out there? You know what I'm talking about? Like, you, anybody ever lost something? Anybody ever lost a kiddo in the room? Come on in the room. Like, I'm talking about, like, you, you, you cannot find them in the room. I, I want to share with you a story into the McLean house. Um, we have four kids, just FYI. We've got Conley, who's 10, Brex, who's 6, and our twin girls, who are 3. And uh, this time last year is about this time, and what we had was a beautiful spring day. We had all the doors open in our house, just kind of letting the thing air out. Come on, sometimes you got to let it air out with four kids, you know what I mean? Okay, uh, so, so just, we're just, we're just loving it. They're playing outside. Conley's actually outside, and she's playing with the girls, and like we give her responsibility. I'm talking about from me to this front row right here. In between a wall, the door is right there. We're on the other side of it. Conley's out there with the girls. And uh, we gave her responsibility. Hey, your job is to watch over your sisters. Mom, dad, going to get ready, and then we'll go. But, like, you watch your sisters really quick, okay? So what, I, what, what began to happen again, beautiful day. They're always playing outside, right on the other side of the door. But they just decided to just start wondering, and here, here we go. Just like an ADHD dad, she may have a little ADHD, but she loses track of her sisters. And all of a sudden, we come outside, and I ask Conley, I say, hey, baby, where's your sisters at? And she's she starts panicking, okay? I'm talking like panicking. I, I, I don't know. And I, Okay, how many of y'all have ever been in that moment right there? How many of y'all handle that really well? Anybody in the room? Because I don't, okay? I'm just going to tell you. So I'm like, what do you mean you don't know where your sisters are? I'm like, where are your sisters? She's like, I don't know. She's hysterically crying. I mean, in a second, hysterically crying. And I want you guys to know that we go on a frantic search for our kids. And I, I want you, first of all, let me just pi- give this picture to you. I, I have a pair of jeans on. I'm barefooted with no shirt on running around the neighborhood, okay? I'm just going to tell you, it's a very wild scene, okay? But, but what happens is we go and we start find, trying to find our kids. We're screaming. We're yelling. Elsie, every, where y'all at? There's a construction zone right beside our house at the time. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they've wandered over. How many of us go to the worst thing possible? Somebody swooped in or they got ran over by one of those big rollers. Or I- I'm-, I'm freaking out. I don't know what's happening. I'm just going to tell you all for five solid minutes that's what's happening. Five minutes. How many of you all know five minutes is a long time? All right? And-, and I want you to understand, we are freaking out. We are turning the house upside down. We're, we're, we're running in the street. We're running around. To the, we started going to the neighbor's houses and say, okay, hey, where are you guys at? Like, like have you seen our look? We go to the very first house that we go to, and it's a, it's, a, it's a house that about four college girls had lived in. And guess what? Everly and Elsie had made their way inside of their covered porch that they had and had knocked on the door. It, was it y'all's house? Oh, my gosh. Thank you. I'm not making this story up, am I? Am I making this up at all? This has happened. This is awesome. I'm just telling you, I, I'm just telling you, four college girls live there, four, three, four, something like that. Okay, three of you. And Everly and Elsie had made their way into, um, like, their, their covered porch and had knocked on the door. And these girls were out there. They were, y'all were just chatting, right? Y'all were chatting, literally chatting together. And the whole time, and here I come, big Sasquatch, no shirt, jeans, <laughs> stomping, they're running. I finally, we found them, we finally found them, and I'm talking about a relief. That is awesome that you're in this service. I love that (laughs) so much right now. I just think that's fantastic. But for a good five minutes, they didn't even know what to do with them. They didn't know whose kids are these, like. (laughs) And I'm not a bad parent, trust me. Like, we love our kids so much, and it's one of those moments where you you literally are panicking and freaking out. How many of y'all know? 
that in that moment where I can't find our girls, and we have four kids, how many of y'all know I didn't just stop looking and be like, well, two out of four ain't bad. <laughs> I mean, I got half of them, you know. I, 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 at least I got my other two. How many of you know I wouldn't do that? And I get to thinking about that. And I think about, that's what put this story in perspective for me. When I started reading this idea of the fact that, that there was 99 sheep that were still found. But there was one that was lost. And I got to thinking about it. When, when, when I realized our girls were lost and we were willing to do whatever we had to do to find them, I knew our other two were safe. I knew they were good. And we went after them. I mean, we went after them. We were willing to do whatever we had to do to go find them and figure out where they were. And I, as I began to read this story, what I got to think is, okay, like, like I, I, it didn't really make sense until that happened for me. Because I would have always thought, and I always thought along, all along, like 100 sheep and you lose one, come on, that's an A in school. Come on, you got a 99 out of 100, no problem. You could lose 10, still feeling good. You know what I mean? Like 90 out of 100. And I say that. Because this is what I want you to know. The reason I can say that is because those aren't my sheep. And I'm not their shepherd. But when it's your own, when it's your own kids, it puts it into complete perspective. That I realized I had two of our kids, but the lost two became the priority. And in that moment of us just trying to figure out what we're going to do, we were willing to do whatever we could to find our lost kids. And I'm just here to tell you today trying to tell you, somebody in this place, that that is how your God, our good shepherd, feels about you. That's how our God feels about you. What that begins to tell me, what I begin to understand is that Jesus loves everybody equally, but the lost are his priority. Jesus loves you. You've heard that. You sang it growing up. I want you to know that is so true today. That Jesus loves every single one of us equally. And I also want to tell you that he loves every single one of us uniquely as well. Not only just equally, but uniquely. And the fact is, is that again, he loved the good shepherd. This is a picture of what Jesus is saying. Hey, this is why I'm coming. I got a hundred sheep. One wanders off. I lost. The, the, that sheep has been lost. But guess what? He was willing. The good shepherd's willing to do whatever he had to do to go after that lost one. That's why he would leave the 99, because that lost one was not just another sheep. It's not just another kid. It's not just another co-worker. It's not just another teammate. It's not just another person in Murray, Kentucky. No, that person has a name, and they mean something to the shepherd. And God said, I'll do whatever I have to do to find the one. I'm willing to leave the 99 with somebody else so I can go after the one that is lost and I believe that God is looking for a church that says, I will, we will do whatever we have to do to go after the one. If that's the God that we serve, if that's what Jesus is trying to get across. And did you realize that in the Bible, Jesus equates you and I to sheep? Did you realize that? That he equates you and I to sheep and that he is the good shepherd? But how many of you know that when he says you and I are sheep, that's not necessarily a compliment? They may be cute and fluffy, but did you realize, here's a couple facts about sheep. They are not very smart. Thanks, Jesus. You know, like, thank you. I want to show you how not smart they are. You've probably seen this video going around online, but if y'all could show this video right here. Sheep that's stuck. Watch. Have y'all seen this? This is how not smart sheep are. Watch. Yeah, you're free, baby. Go for it. Go for it. Woo! Right in the hole again. <laughs> oh man, it's awesome. That's awesome. Right? In, how many of y'all? That's your week. All right, Sunday you getting out of the rut, and now you back in. Okay, I get, it, I get it. But slow mo is even better. I love that. Okay, sweet, awesome. So no sheep were harmed in the making of that video. I don't believe so. Uh, but but I think about that. Jesus says that you and I are a little bit like sheep. That guess what? We're not very smart sometimes. That guess what, I want you to know something else about sheep is that they have no defense mechanism whatsoever. Like they can't see very well. They've got no sense of direction. They stink. And according to the King James Version, they stinketh. Come on, somebody, right? 
Sheep stink. Sheep are stubborn. They literally eat all the grass of the field. They will, they will poop in that same field. They'll eat their own poop, and then they'll end up dying. That's how not smart they are, okay? But yet Jesus is saying, you and I, sometimes what you need to understand is that Jesus is trying to share with you and I that sometimes we will try to get satisfaction ourselves, try to make it on our own, and in turn we're going to wander off in our lost. And if you're like a sheep, here's the thing I want you to know about a sheep is the sheep just cannot find its way home. The sheep realizes it's lost, but they have no way of remembering how to get home. And I think a lot of times if you would look around our world, what you'll find out is there's some people out in our, in our world that are lost like sheep. That they know that they're lost, but they don't know the way home. And it's one thing to be lost like a sheep, it's another thing to be lost like a coin, right? Which is the second story that Jesus uses. Lost like a coin. And again, I think about if you're lost like a sheep, you've got to understand that really what you could do is just listen for the bad, and you'll find the sheep, right? Go to where the noise is, you'll find the sheep. But how many of us know coins don't make noises, right? They don't. Coins don't make a noise. The problem with being lost like a coin is that they don't know that they're lost. They don't make a noise. Coins don't make a sound. They don't know that they're lost. And what this ends up representing are people who are lost. But they don't even realize that they are lost. And sometimes what you need is like this woman right here that's going to sweep the house. Ten coins that she had, one of them goes missing. She cuts the lights on. She moves all the furniture out the way. She's looking under the rug. She's looking in the couch cushions. Come on, somebody, right? She's doing whatever she's got to do to find this coin. And come on, you do the same thing. We would do the same thing. Come on, if $1,000 was missing from your account tomorrow, come on, how many of you know you're flipping it upside down, finding it? Who took my money? I want to know who took my money, right? You would be searching for it. You would, you would go after it. You would be ham about finding that money. And I think Jesus uses this illustration. He uses this analogy because we all know money has value. But so many times we put more value on money than we do people. And sometimes you have incredible value and yet you still don't know that you're lost. Now, I came to just tell somebody today, like this woman that searches for this one coin, she stopped at nothing until she found it. Why? Because lost things still have value. But you got to understand that just because it's lost doesn't mean that it's lost its value. Just because it's lost doesn't mean that it's lost its value. I went to the uh, uh, ATM this morning, and I got out a crisp $100 Benjamin. All right, in the first service, I'm just going to be honest. I said he was the president, Benjamin Franklin. I'm a math guy, okay? So, like, he was definitely not a president, just so everybody knows, all right? So I'm so sorry. Yes, I'm the real pastor. Nobody's coming out next week that's older or wiser or smarter or knows history more, okay? Like, literally, did, who knew that Benjamin Franklin was not a president? Who did not know that Benjamin Franklin was not a president? Come on, raise your hand. With, my men in, uh, yeah, we're like, like okay, what, what grade are you in? Sixth grade, come on, me and you, we jiving together today. Didn't even know it, man. Didn't even know it. Love it. I love that. I love that. But this $100 bill has Benjamin Franklin's face on it, right? It's got the United States seal on it. It lets us know the United States has put a value on this dollar right here. This is worth $100. Like, they have put that on it. They, they have said, okay, we put our seal of approval on it. And here's what I know about this $100 bill is that, you know what I can do? I can actually take this $100 bill, and I can actually crumble it up. Right? I go like this. President Benjamin. Come on, somebody, all right? <laughs> I can stomp it. I can pick it up. I can write on it. Grow him a little mustache. I can lose this right here. Some of y'all are like, boy, would you lose it on the fourth row in the middle? Come on, somebody, right? That'd be great, Lord. Okay. I can lose this. But how many of you know, no matter what I do to this right here, doesn't matter what I do to it, that doesn't determine the value of it. And I want you to just understand something today. Because I think there's so many of us that are letting the world tell you what your value is. But you need to, want, you need to understand that, that there is an image on you from the very beginning. And that's the thing I want to just kind of drill on just a little bit. Whose image is on you? That, yeah, Benjamin Franklin, it's not a president that didn't sign the Declaration of Independence, is on the $100 bill. But whose image is on you? 
And my question for you would be this. Do you realize that the image of God is on you? And whether you profess Jesus as Lord or not, He created you in His image. That on every single person in humanity, God's image is imprinted. That you have never walked by just an ordinary person. Every single person has been created in the image of our God. And some of you have walked in here today, and you've let the world determine your value. And the value is the price someone is willing to pay for something. And I have to just declare today that there was an extreme price paid for you and me. That there was a price that wasn't just a has-been or a second best. No, God gave his one and only son named Jesus. That your life, your, your, your purpose, everything about you being in relationship with God was worth Jesus to God. Come on, is there anybody thankful that God did not just give a second rate, second best, but he gave his one and only son, King Jesus, to come and die for you? Come on, can we give him a big shout of praise and a hand clap of praise in this place? Come on, are you thankful that you got some value? God was willing to send his son, his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. There's a lost sheep, right? If you know you're lost, but you don't have any idea of how to get home, you may be like the lost coin. You don't know that they're lost, but they have incredible value. And that people need to hear that. People need to know that. That you're worth Jesus to God. That you're worth His Son. And the last one is this, the lost son. And this is a different kind of lost. Right? This, this lost son that we didn't actually read. If you go back and read us from verse 11 on to the end of that chapter. Uh, actually, a couple, 32 verses. What I want you to see is there is this story of the lost son. So you've got the lost sheep, you've got the lost coin, you've got the lost son. And what you'll find out is there's some people that in this story, if you go and read it, there's a couple guys, an older son and a younger son. And this younger son was tired of being the father's son. And he said, I wanna, I'm tired of living under your authority. I wish you were dead. I want to do whatever I want to do. And there's some people that are like that. And you want to live your life your way. That you may be tired of the restriction or you're tired of someone else's plan. And the son decides, you know what, I want half of my inheritance now, Dad. I wish you were dead. And what he does is he takes the inheritance and he runs off. And he lives however he wants. And if you go and read the stories in Luke chapter 15, you would expect, all right, like the sheep, the, the shepherd went after him, right? The woman, she went after the coin. I would expect the father to chase after the son. But I, I came to remind some people today, how many of us know that sometimes the most gracious thing that God can do is let you live on your own, is let you try and figure it out on your own? Because what happens is, as all of us have experienced before, is that we can try and make it on our own, but at the end of the day, we're still empty. That there is this, this drive on the inside to be in the presence of our father that nothing else will satisfy. He says he squandered it on living wildly. Like all the pleasures that this world has to offer. He experienced it. And yet he was still lost and still empty. And what I love about this story though. And I, I've heard another pastor say it like this. Is that sin will take you farther than you want to go. Keep you longer than you want to stay. And cost you more than you want to pay. And, and I just believe that some of you are at church today. And maybe you're at the same point that this son was, lost, at, at, at rock bottom, at the, at the end of it. Man, that relationship is gone, that dream is gone, that job is gone, that scholarship is gone. That thing that you've been building your life around may not be as good as it was. That thing that you were drinking is not doing it anymore. That thing that you are smoking to get you high is not touching the lows of your life anymore. And yet even in that, even in the middle of that, that there is the grace of God because you have a loving Savior that even at your darkest, even when you're the emptiest, He's trying to get your attention and tell you that there is nothing that will ever satisfy you like being in the presence of your Father. There's nothing that can, can, can do, can, can fill you like being in the presence of God. And that boy was at rock bottom and the Bible says though that he came to his senses and he thought, you know what, I'll be a slave. That's better than being here. 
And what he does, he heads back towards his father's house. And the whole time he's practicing, thinking he's going to be a slave. But before he ever gets to the front door, guess what's happening? His daddy is waiting on the porch. And boy, I can just imagine that dad. Kind of like I was searching for my kids that day. Looking for my kids. Waiting for them to come home. I'm, I'm, I'm Every day just looking. And he's looking to see if his son's coming home. And what happens is that son tops the hill and the, the dad takes off sprinting towards the son. And I don't know who this is for today. But if you will take one step in repentance towards God, he will take all of the other steps needed to get to him. And he already has by sending his son Jesus. You've just got to come to a point where you realize I need to be in my father's presence. I need to go and he'll take 50 steps towards you. Listen, your life is not over. He loves you so much. He's still waiting for you to come home. That we serve a savior that will run towards the one that realizes, hey, I'm sick of living this way, and it's time to come home. And I love the story how it ends, and you, you may go back to the, the story of the fact of, of the sheep. What happens is, is that when the sheep comes home, when they bring it home, there's a party that happens, right? And when the lost coin is found, guess what happens? There's a party, okay? That's what happens. And then guess what happens right here with this lost son, this son who made all the wrong decisions, this son that wasted his father's inheritance, this son that made a mockery of his family, this son that lived like hell when he came home and the father took off sprinting towards him. What did the dad say? No, no. And he's like, no, no, you don't want, you know, I'm going to be a slave. And he's like, no, 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 no. Kill the fattened calf. DJ, turn that music up. For this son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was what? He was what? He was lost, but now he is found. And the Bible says, so the party began. And so I came to remind us, church, that church should look a whole lot more like a party than it does a funeral. You know what these lost stories tell me and you? Is that we serve a God that no matter what type of sinner you are, one that's been out in the streets or one that's been hiding behind religious masks, that we serve a God who offers a relationship to anybody and will do whatever it takes to get you to the party. Come on, is anybody thankful for Jesus in this place? Can we take 10 seconds and say thank you with a hand clap of praise all over this house? And so here's my invitation for you. Everybody all across this room, let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. Let's land this plane real quick together. I want to tell you something today that I, maybe you needed reminding that you once were lost, but now you're found. Maybe some of you need reminding that the people that you're standing next to or you've been wanting to invite, man, maybe they're lost like the sheep. They know they're lost. They just don't know which way to go. Maybe they're lost like a coin. They don't even know they're lost. Maybe they're lost like the sun. And the sun was blatantly lost, not worried about it. And I would just tell you that maybe we got to do whatever we, maybe we should be the people that say, you know what, we'll do whatever we got to do to get them in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of the Father. And I'm going to encourage you to invite somebody to even Easter this weekend. And I know I said it earlier that like this whole idea of blood, it's going to be a, it's going to be a very simple message this weekend. If there's been somebody that you've been praying for, and I hope today, if it's you that, that may be lost, I want you to know that there's a God that loves you and this church loves you so much. But at the same time, I also want us to be able to hit these doors in just a second and go out in a community and share the love of Jesus. There, there's lost people and found people. And let's be the found people that goes after the lost people. And uh, Because we all were there at one time. And so all across this house, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to make this very quick. I don't want to just take too much time, but I also want to give you the opportunity. Maybe you're in this place and you need to respond to the gospel today. That you're lost. You know it, you don't know it, but the Holy Spirit's been convicting you today and you need to give your heart to Jesus if that's you. There is a, a, a Bible verse that tells us this, that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, that you will be saved. If you need to be saved today, won't you say something like this? Dear Jesus, would you come in my life? Would you save me? I know you did all the work. I just realized my need for you today. I'm a sinner. Would you save me? I need you to forgive me. Come in my life and help me live for you. 
said something like that, said it word for word, whichever way you did that, but you meant it in your heart. First of all, I want you to know that the best thing that you could ever do is realizing your need for Jesus. So if you're here and you say, hey, you know what, I just asked Jesus to save me. If that's you, would you raise your hand up above your head and say, hey, that's me. I just gave my life to Jesus today. I walked in this room. I was lost. But now I'm found. So hey, it's me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to let you know in just a second as we dismiss a couple ways that you can let us know that you made that decision. You can scan that QR code. It's right there on that sticker that's right in front of you. Uh, on your seat, or you can take that salvation card that's right there, fill that bad boy out, and on either side of our platform right here at the end of the service, we have people that we would love to talk with you about this relationship that you just started today with Jesus. Come on, Purpose Church, can we celebrate Jesus in this place today? Come on, can we give him a big shout of praise all over this house? Come on, I hope you all have the best week. Don't forget five services at Easter. Let me pray for you. God bless my friends. Keep them. Turn your face towards them. Shine your favor upon them. And this week, give them peace. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Go love people, love Jesus, serve people, and live on purpose. You're dismissed.